Today is November the 19th, 2018. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and along with me is Larry Caldwell, and he is a retired NRCS engineer, and we are on campus at the USDA office to speak with Gary O'Neill, who became the state conservationist for Oklahoma in 2013 mm -hmm. and had a 30-year career about that time, by that yeah. time. And this is going to be part of our Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is a collaboration between the Oklahoma His Conservation History Society, the Natural Resources Conservation Services, and the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. So thank you for talking with us today. Thank you. Let's begin with learning when and where you were born. Well, I was born in Ponca City, Oklahoma, April 9th, 1960. And tell us a little bit about your parents. Uh, yeah, my mother was um, a, a city girl that um, moved to Ponca City in, in, in her high school, about sophomore year in high school. Her father was a pilot. He came in and uh, was he ran the um, the uh, area aviation department for Conoco Oil, and so he came to Ponca and he flew the executives back and forth from uh, Ponca City to Conoco to Conoco down in Houston. So they met and uh, got married, and then her family all moved back to Houston. Uh, so she, city girl, and my dad was a dairy farmer. Uh, so we, we had a dairy farm uh, about 15 miles southeast of Ponca City over in Osage County. So lived in town for a few years, and then uh, right after I was born, uh, we built a house out on the farm and moved out in the country. Uh, and how long were they in the dairy business? Uh, well, the land still operated uh, by my cousin and my uncle, but no longer a dairy. They sold it in 2004, 2003. So a long time. Oh, yeah. Did it have a name? Ed and Jim O'Neill Dairy. It was just a dairy. Yeah, so, okay. But there used to be a lot of dairies uh, right around there in that part of uh, about 10 or 12, within 5 to 10 miles of that part of Osage County. How big a dairy was it? I mean, uh, anywhere from uh, milked 150 to 200. So it was a big dairy, uh -huh. the biggest mm -hmm. one around that part of the state. And then we uh, farmed a lot of ground. Everything was raised and went in silos. Had three upright silos. Farmed uh, six, 700 acres. And most of that was uh, for silage. Do you remember your first time you drove a tractor? Oh yeah, well I don't remember, but it was young, real young. Uh, I mean, I, I enjoyed dairy. I always thought that's where I'd go back, and mm -hmm. went to school with all intentions of going back and being part of that. Uh, somewhere along the road, I made a switch. But, <laughs> yeah, I liked uh, the dairy farming. I uh, liked working with the cows, the cow part of it. I'm thinking by the time you were helping, it was probably electric milkers by, oh, yeah. by that time. Uh, you didn't have to do it by hand. Yeah, I don't remember any bucket milking, any of that. I mean, I heard stories about mm -hmm. it. But, so we had a, a milk three on a side, so a parlor that milked six at a time. And then uh, when I was in about junior high, probably we went to six on a side, so you could milk 12 at a time, uh, which was a big, big change. But yeah, we had the automatic takeoffs and uh, all the new high technology. My dad was a surge dairy equipment dealer on the side. Okay. Uh, and then he also sold Farmers Union insurance on the side, so he worked hard. And so what would be your chores doing, doing all this? What were well, your uh, during the school year, we would uh, get up early before going to school and do a few things, but usually when we'd come home feeding uh, feeding cows, milking, uh, depending on where we were at in, in cropping, whether we were still cutting silage and stuff, would be a little bit of that. But then in the summers, it was, uh, you know, full-time putting up hay, putting up silage, farming all that ground. So I can remember my brother and I getting up and we used to plow, which is a bad word now. We don't plow, but we did. And we bought uh, two ha uh, two quarter sections, and we were plowing around the whole whole thing. And so we plowed that day and night till we got it done. So we did a lot of tractor work. Uh, we had registered cows. So we we showed cattle when we were in uh, school. 4-H or F F A F F A, F -F -A. and 
uh, showed them all over. Even went to Madison, Wisconsin one year. I mean, we had a pretty high powered herd, so it was a good, good herd. Unless you had John Deere. No, international, yeah. all international. <laughs> no green equipment, all red. And a few pieces of green when you couldn't get red, but big international dealer in Ponca years ago. Okay. Wilkins equipment, of course it's long gone now, but uh, so a lot of red around that part of where we were at. So it was just you and a brother? Two brothers and a sister. Okay. Um, and then the youngest brother stayed on at the farm. And we were partners with my uncle. So it's two families, my dad and his brother, and then his kids. He had uh, three, two boys and three girls. But we really didn't have much hired hands. It was the family mm -hmm. that ran it. And my mom, she had chores. And my grandma either. I remember her uh, feeding baby calves, you know, with the, with the bottles. But, uh, Made some good bond in time, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. your dad and brother start the operation there? Yeah. Uh, well, their dad ran it. Their dad. Yeah. And then he died fairly young. He was only uh, mid-60s, and then, so they took it over. Mm -hmm. But that, that's all my dad ever did was the dairy. Mm -hmm. And uh, made a good living, and um, it was successful. But it is a lot of work. and. But it was nice having two families where, you know, you could get away for, we always took a family vacation every summer, mm -hmm. go see the Cardinals play or something. So uh, that was always important that we always took a trip. Now, a lot of times we'd go look at dairy cows and dairy farms, <laughs> kind of like going to look at flood control structures, but <laughs> we did do a lot of that. I used to hear my mom complaining about that. We got cows at home. Why do we have to go look at cows when we go on trips? But we did do a lot of that. So. Sample milk along the way? Part, yeah. Sam sample some milk? Yeah, a little yeah. bit of that. A little bit of it. Well, if all that work, what would you do for fun? Uh, we would play baseball and basketball and football. Uh, two brothers, so we, we played a lot of sports. And okay. We had motorcycles out there and we had fun. Play chicken on the tractors? No, I didn't do much <laughs> of that, but a lot of work, but it's a good, good life style. Yeah. And I know this might be a dumb question, but can you really tip a cow? Tip a cow. Tip, tip. You hear tip a cow? No. Not familiar with that. Okay. Cow tipping? Cow tipping? <laughs> no. No, I don't know that one. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, talk about your education. Where did you go to elementary school? Uh, St. Mary's Catholic School in Ponca. Okay. Uh, that was one through six. Um, my sister went all the way through high school. They had a high school at one time. Uh, St. Mary's did, but it had closed, and so I went to junior high at East Junior High in Ponca, and then high school at Ponca City High School. And graduated in what year? 78. And what was your favorite class or subject? Basketball. Not, not sports. Basketball. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, history. I liked history and sciences. You know. Okay. You know, kind of FFA, active in FFA. Was church an important part of Yeah, we were Catholics too? in uh, St. Mary's, big big family and yeah never missed a Sunday so okay so yeah. once you graduated waited from high school what was your plan well I was going to OSU but going back to milk dairy I mean we talked about it and uh, that was pretty much the plan but uh, got married my junior year to a high school sweetheart she was from Ponca City too so uh, and she was okay with that. I wasn't real excited about that choice of lifestyle. So uh, our, our neighbor here in Stillwater was Dwayne Gellner. He was a soil scientist for SCS at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty close to him and his wife. And um, he told me that SCS was looking for an ag economist. That's what I got my degree in was ag econ. Okay. And I said, oh, yeah, and really didn't know much about SCS. I remember back in my junior high years, we built some terraces uh, and waterways and a great stave. And I remember SCS being involved. I didn't even know anything about the agency before then. Didn't really know much about it. I never worked for them as a summer intern or anything. But anyway, Dwayne encouraged me to send a resume. And so I did, or a letter is what I said, not a resume. I got a call from uh, Dan Vandersype, or Don Vandersype. And Larry knows all about him, but he uh, 
talk to my wife, and they, they're the ones that set up the interview. I didn't even talk to him. My wife answered the phone and talked to him. So I came over here and did it at the state office, and I think he offered me a job that day. Wow. Or very soon after. Uh, and he said they had a position open in Chickasha on the watershed planning staff. And that he wanted me to go to a field office first. And so, you know, I thought, well, what the heck, let's do this for a while. I can always go back and milk. I mean, that's not a deal. And, you know, my dad wasn't chomping at another family coming into it. So, so I accepted, went to Holdenville, uh, right out of school. And um, I think we started, I started in January. I'm still going down there. I remember looking at housing, and it's pretty depressing. There wasn't much to live in the whole. We finally found a, a little uh, duplex to rent, and so we started. I was in '83. Started career in Holdenville as a soil conservationist mm -hmm. with with SCS. And you graduated in '83 as well. Yeah. So well, '82, and then I got this job in '83. So it was about three or four months afterwards. So. Okay. Then how long were you there? About 11 months, uh, and then I, was, I went to Chickasha. Uh, that's where they really wanted They wanted me to spend a little time in the field office, and I enjoyed it. I uh, had a really good experience. Uh, very good conservation district secretary and district board, and just lived up the street from the office, and it was fun. We had good neighbors that lived next to us when we were young and didn't have a cent to our name and thought it was great, so it was fun. <laughs> We enjoyed uh, the, the year there and then went to Chickasha to the watershed planning office there as a, an economist trainee is really what it was. So not knowing a lot about the watersheds. Hughes County had a lot of flood control structures and I remember going out with the technician and looking at uh, the Woka Creek I think is what, what it was probably. Yeah, so, uh, but, so that, that was kind of the start of that and then we went to Chickasha. Who was the economist at Chickasha? Tootle. Tootle oh. was the, the economist, and um, Bob at, or, um, oh, the D.C. at uh, Cherokee. Dotson. Oh, Robert he, Dotson. He had, he had left. And there was another one that, uh, another one that who went and re resigned and went to work in oil field. Dale. He went to work in an oil field position. He was an economist. I can't remember his name before me. Dale something, I can't remember his name. But, uh, and then Porter was in Claremore. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time together, the three of us. But mm -hmm. it was a good, good staff there. A bunch of veterans had been there forever. Ludwig, Jack Clayton was a geologist. Uh, Pat Hodges was a mm -hmm. CET. Sammy. Was the mm -hmm. CT so? Mm -hmm. uh, Leverton was the staff leader when I started. Then he retired, and uh, the one came that was from Claremore that went on to Fort Worth for a little while. I can't think of his name. His daughter worked. Or is maybe a little bit as well. Hmm. Can't think of his name, but. Uh, so so basically got on the watershed planning staff at that time. What projects were you working on? You um, yeah, uh, Little Beaver was the, was oh. a big one we were planning. Uh, and then Deer Creek, North Deer Creek, we were doing the recreation stuff. I got a chance to work on the recreation facilities on, on North Deer Creek. Uh, and then there was some more down there around... Cow Creek or something? Or, Cow Creek would have been that time. Yeah, I don't remember something like that and some others. But Deer Creek or, or uh, Beaver Creek are for sure remember being involved in that. Did you get out in the field a lot working with the field staff and landowners? Yeah, uh, collecting damage in, survey and interviews, doing a lot of that. With landowners? Yeah, with landowners. We had forms to fill out and just basically go and talk to them. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of that. And we we take go out and look at preliminary stuff as a group, which I always thought was pretty good. You know, the, the whole disciplines and we'd get a request to come out and look at something and we'd go out and spend a day or two, do a little preliminary study. A lot of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Who were the, the hydrologists you worked with hand in hand? James Ludwig was the main one, and then Terry Costner came on. I think he may be in Alaska now. Yeah, I think, I think yeah Costner was there. But Lud was the main. He was he was the man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to have a lot of fun with that staff. Uh, I was kind of the kid all in the group because a lot of them have been there. Well, Dallas was on that staff too. So, and uh, he was probably the one that we got the closest to. He used to go over to his house a lot with when we when we had kids. But we just lived down the street from him. So. Spent a lot of time with him. And you mentioned recreational facilities. What what did that involve? Um, that that lake had picnic pavilions, oh, and good. so we we got a chance to work with uh, some groups to lay that out and then come up with the benefits for it. Never done that. Never mm -hmm. never been involved in that at all. So so I was there about five years. Mm -hmm. um, from roughly 84 to about 89 and the watershed staff and I, I be, came in as a soil conservationist and then got promoted so I got my love in there in Chickasha for I left but uh, good good experience got to learn a lot about watershed program um, were you given a choice about leaving or you were just looking to leave some no, no, I was stories. definitely given a choice. Uh, it was one of those deals where you, we decided we'd go out of state, which was a big move. Um, so there was a position in Albuquerque, and that's where I put in for that. And it was a 12 economist position uh, at the state office, and there was both watersheds and CTA uh, uh, program. So. Uh, didn't really know anyone out there, but it looked like a pretty good place to go. So we. <laughs> and by that point, you decided it was going to be a career for you, and not. Uh, not yet. There, I don't not think. <laughs> Jury was still out, but we were, we were enjoying ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, two daughters were born in Chickasha, uh, Mallory and Morgan. And then uh, my wife found out she was pregnant with my son right when we were moving. He was born in Albuquerque. Uh, so Adam, he was born in ninety. So it was a big, big change. Yes. Uh, good staff had a great staff out there. Bob McQueen was my boss, and uh, Roger Ford was involved. Mm -hmm. He was a planning engineer. Uh, David McKay was an agronomist. He became a state conservationist. A really good, good staff. Uh, what were the projects going on there? Uh, water resources projects, but also I got involved in just conservation things, trying to put an economic. A twist on different things. So I got a chance to do a lot of different things. Uh, work on forestry projects, uh, work with tribes on different things. We did a lot of neutral planning where we'd go in and develop a little plan, uh, what the, the uh, problems were, here's some potential uh, fixes for it, and here's some potential funding sources for it. We did I don't know, five or six or seven of those uh, kind of projects, and each staff person would lead some, so I got a chance to lead different disciplines mm -hmm. and good experience, different resource concerns, different resources. Uh, you go out and look at range and think it's terrible. No, this is good condition range. Uh, you know, when you get six, eight, ten inches of rain a year, the vegetation looks a little different than it does in Oklahoma. So. Had you been in New Mexico before you took that uh, job? Not really. Um, no, I can't remember hardly ever. Really? Uh, <laughs> um, so we learned the, the, the way home pretty easy. Uh, my wife's family lived in Wichita, so we'd come to Tucumcari and cut across uh, the Panhandle and get to uh, western Kansas and come in 54 to Wichita. And home to Oklahoma easy, so. Yeah, a good, good uh, neighborhood. Albuquerque is a fast-growing city. Mm -hmm. uh, schools weren't very good. That was a big issue. Uh, I enjoyed the job. Uh, good state conservationist. Uh, Ray Margo was there for a few years. Then Tom Weber came in mm -hmm. for a year or two. And then um, as I left, another one, Rosendo, came mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
uh, totally different kind of flood control structures, um, big giant spillways. Uh, no water. No water. Dry structures, you'd think they'd never fill up, but they had those big spillways for a reason. Mm -hmm. When it did rain, it, it, everything ran off. It was weird, so. But uh, it was good. We were there five years. Uh, yeah, I think it was five years. Yeah, till about. 93 and that's when um, they opened up regional offices mm -hmm. and so it was a big change for the agency and I don't remember Larry if you remember but it had like hundreds and hundreds of advertisements mm -hmm. came out at one time big, yeah and so I put in for uh, several of them um, we wanted to get closer to home but is just we were ready for a change as well. The schools in Albuquerque, we were going to have to do private schools. And so we thought, well, it's probably somewhere else. So I applied for Fort Worth, and I applied for Lincoln. And then at the last minute, and I don't even think I told Darla, but I put in for Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and wouldn't you know, I got the call and I offered the position in Madison, Wisconsin. So never been to Madison. Surely not closer to home. Mm -hmm. No. It's a long way, so... Uh, and a lot colder than a lot colder. How did she take that when you? Did? Uh, she wasn't thrilled, <laughs> but she she was good, and we loaded up and moved to Madison. How old were your kids? At um, that time? Mallory was in about fifth, fourth grade. Morgan hadn't started school yet, and Adam hadn't. Or she was in first, so they were young. Pretty young. Pretty young. Well, that was your fourth move in a, you know, yeah, a dozen uh, years or so. And this one we stayed a while. Uh, so job was good, regional office, opening up a whole new division. Uh, brought in like 12 of us to at the start core group and then kind of built the program. Eight Midwest states that I'd really never been to, Great Lake, Corn Belt states. So a lot of different opportunities there. Um, so a career decision at that point? Make yeah, make prob probably. I mean, <laughs> so that was, I got my 13, 14 there. So great opportunity. Uh, high grade positions, lots of responsibility, uh, good staff. Got to meet some really good, good individuals. Harry Slaughter was on that. Not so much on Watersheds program now. It was totally different. I was a management analyst. It was my title. And I worked between two staffs, the O&E staff and then the strategic planning staff. Uh, they had one position that floated between the two of them. Uh, there was an engineer on staff. I can't remember. Larry Dawson is the Larry one. Dawson, Do you remember yeah. him? Larry yeah, Dawson. Yeah, I didn't know him personally. One. but yeah. I'm trying to remember where he came from. Somewhere northwest, I think. Uh, Greg Johnson, Bill Bill Johnson, Bill Bill Johnson was the, no, that's not right, Bill something, I can't think of his name, their strategic planner, Ron Williams. Uh, Did that region go over to the Dakotas or no, Minnesota, Iowa? No, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, wow. Michigan, okay. Wisconsin, yeah, there was eight states. Missouri was part of it too. Oh, okay. Yeah, Missouri, that was the eight state. Did you get out? Yeah, a lot. a lot. We went we went out a lot. Whether it was during reviews or whatever, the mm -hmm. chance. Uh, one of my biggest jobs became WRP. That was they just kind of handed that off to me. So I worked with MISO at headquarters and mm -hmm. allocated dollars to states. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, a big move. Your economic courses from OSU come in handy at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. At that point. But we loved it there. Great place to live. Uh, a little expensive and a little cold. In Dane County, Madison's a little, it's a little different, but gosh, it's great place. Great schools. Uh, hardly no crime. Great sporting events. I mean, we settled in a little town outside of Wanakee, is the name of it. And you know, it was just a great place to raise kids. It's and the Badgers, aren't they? They're the Badgers. Mm -hmm. And 
really became home. We were there 10 years. Hmm. So um, kids basically grew up there. But it was a long haul back to Wichita and Ponca. And we did it a lot. And that became real old. Mm. Went through Des Moines a lot, across Iowa. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For you, it would be. No, I like Iowa. It's a good state. But, mm -hmm. but so, that was a good good career move. So, uh, 10 years, it would have been 2000? 2004. You? Yeah, about 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. When we were there, Charles Whitmore was the regional conservationist. He was there most of the time. Uh, it changed there at the end, uh, but a, a good guy built a lot of relationships with states. Uh, state conservationist up there. It was a good career move, career, good opportunity. And then, uh, all, like all good things, it comes to an end. The reorganization closed the regional offices, so. It wasn't you going looking, it was... Yeah, this was uh, basically, I got a letter that said, your job is in D.C. I mean, Larry may know about those letters, uh -huh, but uh -huh. I was going to be on Kathy Gugulis' staff, which was kind of uh, accountability, stuff like that. Um, didn't thrill me at all. Uh, and plus, my oldest was going to school, and she was coming to OSU. Okay. So she had already enrolled at OSU. She was coming down here. So we thought it was high time to make a move. So I called my good friend, Daryl Dominic, uh, who was, you've probably talked to Daryl. Mm -hmm. He says, well, I, I know of something we may have. Uh, you just have to apply. It's not the same grade, but at least get you back. So uh, I'd actually got the letter when I was supposed to report to DC. So this was sometime around 2004, into 2003. And so they were in the process of dismantling the office. I mean, it was that close. And uh, there was a position in Oklahoma that called the program liaison, which was a program position in McAllister. And uh, so I was a GS-14, it was a 12, but it, it got us back to Oklahoma. And so I applied and got that position mm -hmm. to come back to Oklahoma, uh, which was a good move for mm -hmm. the family and me. You know, I'd never really worked in middle management in a state. Uh, kind of miss that. When you go to a regional office, you miss some of those different career ladders that you could have got. Mm -hmm. I, I miss those. So, uh, so you know, Daryl said, come back, and you never know what might happen when you get back here. So I, I did that for a year. And knowing I didn't want to live in McAllister with two high school kids and then move them again, so we opted. Uh, we had my wife's family all lived in Edmond area, so we lived there. Mm. It's a long drive from Edmond to McAllister. Yep. And I did that for almost a year. Drive back and forth on weekends? Mm -hmm. Even some during the, you know, every night, if something was going on. So it's a long drive. <laughs> what, was, what was going on in McAllister? Well, that was, uh, there was a, an area office there. And that's where the position was. And that was a good job. It, they just kind of established those positions. Working with field offices helped them do program stuff. Protrax had just came out then. Uh, so and I think there was a little bit of people saying, who's this guy from the regional office coming? But that didn't last long. I mean, you can prove that you can help them. It worked mm -hmm. out fine, so I didn't have any real problems. Uh, it was good. So about a year and then... Um, Less, less retired. Less Connor retired, and uh, so they uh, advertised a position up here at the state office, assistant for operations, and I applied and was fortunate enough to get the position. So, so that's about the time your dad sold uh, the dairy. Yeah, uh, just a couple years yeah. before that, he sold about '03, I think, is when he sold. So the time you came to McAllister, then. Yeah, pretty close. Pretty close. So by that time you decided you weren't going. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to dairy business. Uh, you know, it's funny how that works. You you miss it a lot, and then you gradually miss it less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> After about, you know, I kind of like this just working five days a week, and mm -hmm. having your weekends free and your evenings free. And mm -hmm. Dairying was hard, and it was. Uh, 
it tied you down. I mean, they had to be milked every day. Yeah, sign up to say Twice that, a day. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to take this day off. So, yeah. Then there were some lean times in that period, too, when milk prices were down and it's kind of hard to, to start up. So, it just never did work out. But, so the career always looked a little better. What was your end goal for once you once you decided this was going to be your career? What was your well? I don't know. I really had any. I sure never thought about a state conservationist position. I really never did. I think once I got back and then got in this operations job, and kind of, I mean, I worked close with Daryl, spent a lot of hours with him. Mm. He's a good manager. And I got to thinking, you know, who knows? You could go somewhere else. I never dreamed it would be in Oklahoma. Because Daryl's not much older than me, and I didn't think he was ever going to go anywhere. And uh, so I didn't see that being an option at all. So maybe something in the back of your mind, someday you might. But we were home, and that was the number one thing, I think, at that point. Uh, being back close to family, and where you could still go see people and not have to stay a week. Or I mean, it, it's, it's all my kids ever knew, is, you know, we're going to go back for... Every Christmas, we'd come back and stay a week or 10 days. And we'd have to have our Christmases, uh, you know, a week in advance. <laughs> Had this elaborate story that, you know, Santa Claus <laughs> knew that and would come early. So. so we sacrificed on that. And that's part of the decision. I always tell young employees, you, you got to make sure it works for you moving away. It's not for everybody. you gotta, you got to make it work. And there are some sacrifices when you do that. If you're close to your family, well, and your, did your wife have a, a job that would allow uh, her to well, move uh, around to? In Wisconsin, she really never worked anything steady. She did a few things. Uh, she worked at a travel agency for a number of years uh, there, and when she got back here, uh, so really, while the kids were little, she stayed yeah. home and did that important job. Uh, she got back here, she got on with an oil and gas company. Now she's been working almost 16 years, so mm -hmm. she's done really well. But, uh, no, we thought it was more important on being there for the kids for most of the time. So from the time you came back to McAllister, you had lived in Edmond that yeah. entire, entire time? Yeah, we moved a couple of different places mm -hmm. while we've been down there, but yeah. And you're still there now, and you commute. You We're in commute Oklahoma City, here. yeah, now. So and you commute up here, uh -huh, most which days. is a piece of cake for Red, uh, McAllister. Sure, <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, so yeah, that was in '04, and um, and then did the operation and did SAO for a year or two. That was really hard to do those two jobs, and Daryl. He demanded a lot. He needed a lot. So it was some long hours and a lot of work. Uh, and then you know, Daryl's thing happened and he, he retired early after, I don't know how many years it was. And then Ron Hilliard came in after that. So kind of got close to Ron and basically was kind of his assistant, you know, worked kind of like a deputy in some respects for his operations. Learned a whole lot. Uh, that level of middle management that I'd never really, you know, had a chance to do. Mm -hmm. and worked a lot with the partners. Uh, really made a close relationship with Ben Pollard. He was with the Conservation Commission. I don't know if you've talked to Ben yet or not, but... Not on an interview. Not yeah, yet. he'd be a good one, but... Um, so when Ron retired, threw my name in and happened, happened to get it, so... It doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. I mean, Larry can tell you, there's not many people. For sure. Used to be state conservationists in their home state. No, no. And that was in 13. So, you know, I never really had this aspiration 20 years ago I'd be a state conservationist. It just kind of happened. And that's what I tell young people is, you know, you can set goals, but be flexible because you never know what might open up because things are going to change. Well, what would be the next level up? There is no next level up for me <laughs> on where I want to be. No, but if there was. Uh, headquarters. There's For chief? No, no. no. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of positions up there. They're looking for positions. 
uh, at the national office level, but I have, I have no interest in that. I'm, I'm where I want to be. Uh, I just want to make Oklahoma as good as it can be. I don't have any desire for anything else. But yeah, there's a lot of opportunities in here for us. And we've had a few do that from here. Larry used to be part of headquarters. Mm -hmm. But he got to do it for Stillwater. That's mm -hmm. a little different. Yeah, <laughs> a lot different. Mo most of them has, have no desire to go to D.C. No, it's... Uh, so. I mean, the, the work could be interesting for a while, but there's a lot of disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Commute and... Yeah. Different environment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Too. And when I've been up there on details, it's just chaos. You know, every day is chaos. You know, you got this comes in, you got to answer it, and I mean, it's just nonstop. So the days go quick. Mm -hmm. For some, and I think others just kind of roam the halls. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's they play an important role, but no, I'm not interested in that. So. Well, there in your 30 some years, there's been lots of programs come and go. Have you, you know, to speak to any of those? That well, the watershed program, uh, I kind of grew up on that, and then I went away from it and was kind of out of touch when, during the whole rehab stuff, you know while that was going on, but then getting back and seeing how big it is to Oklahoma, how important it is and how, you know, big deal it is and that it's, it's going to be there forever. You know, those structures will be there for all our lives and our kids' lives. So someone needs to take care of them. So that's an important program and it's now starting to get a little more national attention. So I think it's important that our, some of our employees don't know anything about it never really worked in counties where they have much to do with it so we need to make sure they understand it and so they can t take care of this after Larry and I are gone someone needs to so now it's 50 years on some of them or most of them have been 50 years over so half of them now are a lot of 50 years old well, you're one of the few state conservationists that have any direct watershed yeah, experience probably right? I don't know I don't know if uh, did uh, JR ever yeah. I mean, he might have been an a AC. AC, but I don't Mike know. Sullivan. Mike has a lot of interest has, in has you can lot. tell. But I don't know if he ever worked as an engineer. Not directly like that, but yeah, you're one of the few that has the direct watershed yeah. experience or you can relate to the details. Yeah, I don't know that any of them's ever been through a plan and understand all that components and all the hydrology. And yeah. yeah, probably not many. And even when you're in the regional office, you had a little touch of, I think you were involved in a rehab, rehab yeah. study. Yeah, there was. We had some of that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was a, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. And we skipped a state in there. Were you in Michigan for a while? I, I did a detail in Michigan, and that was a big deal. Uh, when I was here in operations, uh, I got a call from Tom Christensen, who's kind of been a mentor of mine. He said, he was the regional con at that time, he said, I need somebody to go to Michigan for a while. And Ron was state conservationist here at the time. So so I said, yeah, that's fine. I think it was in 11 or 12. Um, and it was four months. And, you know, you can really get in depth in some issues in four months. And so I learned a lot. Worked with their partners and they had whole different issues. Wetlands was a big issue there. So I, I think that helped me prepare for this job. You can, you can act a week or two, and but you know being up there and being in charge for you know throwing into a job, it, it's a good experience, and that that helped a lot. And I, I think I did all right, which helped. You know, if you go up there and fall on your face, it probably wouldn't mm -hmm. help you much. But, yeah, sink or swim. Yeah, so okay. I, I think that helped. I spent a couple of them. I went up there to D.C. on an R.C. and D. thing program got shut down, so I don't know if I did any good on that one. <laughs> uh, that was a full thing. But that wasn't because of you? That... No, they'd been trying to zero that program out for years, and it finally happened. But... Looking back on your career, are there any special projects that you recall as being a, one that you're uh, proud of on accomplishments? And... Yeah, there was one in, in New Mexico. It was a pretty simple deal. Sandia Pueblo, mm -hmm. north of Albuquerque had this creek that came through their land and it was just eroding something terrible. And this is one of these neutral planning things. And so I was leading that one and I met with their tribe and uh, I mean, they were just 
looking for answers and I, I remember they seemed very uh, appreciative of the project and and we had an award outstanding employee in New Mexico we did that every year and I remember that was the year I did that and they made a big deal about it I didn't, I got second but uh, I remember that so that one was pretty neat did they go on through implementation after uh, that did they, they they did they went and they got some funding from BI and some other things. We were, we planned a structure. I assume it got built. I left about after that. But they ran into cultural resource issues. I know that, mm -hmm. which you could understand. Mm -hmm. It's on Pueblo land. But, uh, I spent a month in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, one year doing a project. I know that one never went off, went anywhere. It was a uh, flood control flat as a pancake really wasn't any good options but my job was to come up with damages uh, so i spent a summer up there doing that interesting work different mm -hmm. never got dark while i was up there so but i've had a lot of opportunities to work on unique stuff regional office there's some interesting things and you mentioned your mentor did you want to say a little bit more about him? Well, Tom Christensen, I worked with him a lot. He was the state conservationist in Illinois when I was in Madison. I first met him then and respected him. Uh, he, he could read more. He worked with him. Very much so. He could read and pick up something quicker than I could ever remember anybody doing that. He, he was a workaholic. He would never quit working, I don't think. Uh, always was impressed with his commitment and dedication to the agency. Now an associate chief. Well, so now he's part of the new business center. Business center, yeah. Yeah. He was uh, the number two man in the agency up until last week or a couple of weeks. Yeah. Ago. He's a. Uh, How much older than you? I don't he? know. He's probably not that much older. He must be mid 60s. At least, yeah. He's Good man. worked 39 years, is what he said last week. Yeah, that's right or two weeks ago. But you know, I've met a lot of those guys, the gals. And that's one thing, I, and when I go talk to young employees, you know, it's a big part of our agency is building a network. And, and um, it helps you through the processes because you don't, as a selecting official, someone applies for a position, I'm gonna reach out to wherever that person works and talk to some people. And so the more you build some of those relationships, the better off you, you can be on career advancements. Plus, people that have been there, they understand the ropes and can help you. Mm -hmm. I've had some good ones. Daryl was a good one. Uh, Harry Slaughter was very good to me. Uh, just had a number of them. This guy right here has been a good one. So, I mean, there's, you just meet these kind of people throughout your career. And it's important to have them. Like a family, too. In the yeah, extended, and already see it. Is. It really is pretty pretty much that. And well, in the course of your career, did, when did women start showing up? In, in well, in the, I'm trying to think. At the, at the watershed office, we, we really didn't have any women there. Went to Albuquerque and not a lot on our staff. Went to the regional office and we had mm -hmm. several females on positions there it's it's just grown yeah. uh, into the 80s or 70s at it, least yeah and now when we hire a group of students we, we get more females than we do males hmm. the last two or three years we bring on our interns and we'll have more females in our intern list than males and, and the good ones a lot of them are the females we have some really excellent uh, so you know what you think ag maybe not but we got a, a lot of people are interested in our career path that are females and great opportunities and no one no one thinks anything of it now at all well there's more in engineering now too i guess there's more to, yeah, to we've select had several in yeah. engineers recently yes i think in biosystems engineering the students there's more females than the males even right now so. yeah Good opportunities. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that, but you know, early in the career, we, there wasn't many. Mm 
females in the workforce of our agency. Well, in, in college, were, were there many in your class, I in your classes? Probably not. Probably I not. I don't remember so. as much. I mean, that's the first step. They've got to get those degrees. I Maybe guess. ag, there wasn't as many. I don't know. But boy, now it's not that way. Hmm. We, we have a lot of interest in range or whatever we're hiring. So, and you were the state was 2013 is when you came as state conservationist. State conservationist. Yeah, so it'll be six years in April. What's been some of the issues during the, that five, six year span within, oh, within Oklahoma? <laughs> you had any challenges? No, oh, a few. Well, the monarchs came across. I have, we have to talk about monarchs a little bit. Yeah, yeah. monarchs, uh, prairie chickens, and we've had a lot of species issues. Uh, the beetle, bats, we work on projects for bats, uh, big eared bat. The Barian beetle no, or a different Barian beetles. Beetle. So, mm -hmm. that, that was uh, continues to be a challenge where we're building dams and earth doing earthwork. Mm -hmm. And then there's always employee issues. Our partnerships have went through state budget issues for I don't know how many years, uh, which has been a challenge. We're connected very closely to conservation districts and state government. Probably our most critical partner is our state and local district group, and they've had budget issues, which doesn't directly affect us, but it does because we share work and we man offices together, and they've, they've had a lot of issues. Uh, and we just recently restructured, but we started that three years ago. So we've been working on that three years and finally just now got a chance to implement it. And it's a drastic change. We're changing a structure that's been there since the 30s. Mm. Uh, so it's a huge change, and I hope it's the right direction. I think it is. But what, pro what prompted it? Uh, staff, dwindling staff numbers, uh, variable workload from county to county. So it was, it was getting harder and harder to staff counties to handle the work. Uh, we were getting so thin in places you have a retirement or somebody leaves, you know, you, how do you handle the work? So we've set up teams and we're set up now in 21 different teams mm -hmm. and that staff within that team will address the workload. Uh, gives us a little more stability and hopefully to be able to specialize a little more in some of our staffing. Uh, instead of 77 supervisors, we now have 21 supervisors. So that's a big change. Yeah. yeah. So. It's a big, big leap. Uh, and really, the team around me put that together, uh, Bill Porter and some others. I mean, we started this, like I say, three years ago, and it took that long to get it all approved. Of course, we had an administration change, and that shut things down for about a year. Makes it yeah. And change does not come easy. No, it doesn't. But, I mean, that, that's been a big deal. Uh, but I, I got a very good job. State Conservation is a good position. They've taken a lot of authorities away, but we, I still have the authority to make a difference in this state. We can direct resources. We have a lot of flexibility in what we can use our technical assistance dollars on. We can do agreements that can do really neat, innovative things and help other groups to get conservation on the ground. So. Was Oklahoma leading the pack in anything in particular at the moment? What do you think, Larry? Do we lead the pack? We, we have the most watershed structures. Well, I mean, I know, I know well, that's watershed good. rehabilitation. Yeah. Rehab. Yeah. Far, yeah. We, uh, we have a good program. We have a lot of big farm bill programs that we, country stewardship program, we're, we're one of the big leaders in that. I was reading something about water quality. We, we, delist, we delisted more streams and segments. Uh, we work with Conservation Commission on that. I think a lot of that is because they've got a very good monitoring system where they can show the changes, you know, in water quality. If you don't have the data, you can't prove that you're having any impact. And so they've got 20 plus years of long-term monitoring so they can tell when something changes and you can get it delisted. So. That's a big success, I think, in, in our state. And it's a partnership, an opportunity for us to work with the, the districts. So.
That's, that's one big. thing I would really see Oklahoma shines in is that partnership effort. Every every state has that, but it, I think Oklahoma has, really has a special relationship. Yeah, it there. works pretty good here. I think you've really cultivated that and have the and respect tr of people. Trey and the, the ones before us has done good. I mean, Daryl was phenomenal at that, and Mike Thralls, who worked at the Conservation Commission, was. We just solid. We've had solid people. Well, and it's involving the tribe, tribal aspect of things too. We're starting to work more and more with tribes. Uh, you know, I think the gaming has industry's given them resources, and now a lot of them are buying land. And I think they're thinking, you know, the gaming may not be sustainable forever, so maybe we ought to look at other stuff. So there's a lot of them getting into natural resources and. Uh, so we, we've done some things with them, and they're becoming a better better partner, I think, mm -hmm. an important partner for us in Oklahoma. We've got two of them that's established conservation districts and three more that are in the process, so that's new. Uh, and the commission's been open-armed, you know, with them to add to the district family, so I think, I think it's good. I don't know that I want 39 of them districts, but a handful, I think, is good because some of those tribes are serious about conservation. So. They might have to combine to be part of your 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have tremendous resources, though, too. So you know, that, that's another great opportunity. So. That's one thing we have in Oklahoma, you know, 39 federally recognized tribes. So mm -hmm. there's some opportunities there. And I was reading something about family farm to food bank. Yeah, that was a new project. We uh, we got some farmers. Of cover crop soil health has been a big thing that we've done in the last few years, and growing covers and understanding how protecting that soil, having something growing year round, is really important. Diversity. So we've got some farmers, and we've got one that's just kind of leading the Southern Plains. Jimmy Emmons, uh, he now speaks all over the country, all over the world about soil health, but. Uh, they, some of them would grow a cover crop that had food, some edible produce in it, like melons, cucumbers, squash. They still get the benefits of the cover crop, but then you can glean and actually pick during the year and give that to, to food banks. So we entered into a partnership with the regional food bank. They handle all the gleaning and the volunteers, and a farmer donates a one to two acre plot, and we get the seed donated. And uh, you can grow a lot of uh, uh, okra and cucumbers and squash on two acres. Mm -hmm. So there are like 15 farmers this year that did that. So mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Yeah. The challenge has been the, re the food bank getting the volunteers because you go out there and it's hard to imagine what an acre or two acres of it's just broadcasted or planted, so it's not a row of okra and a row of this. It's just, they call it a chaotic garden. And just to walk through it is a challenge. Uh, so to get somebody from downtown Oklahoma City to go out and help glean this, and then know enough to pick the right stuff. You know, this green thing, is it a green melon or is it a green pumpkin that's not ready yet? So you got to know the right stuff to pick. But uh, it's been interesting. I don't know of any other state that's done it. We've not heard of any. Uh, but it's a win-win. And surprised, you know, there's a lot of farmers willing to give an acre or two up because they're gonna, just going to have a cover crop anyway and they're not going to harvest it. So it's worked pretty well. And where would you present this to in order to get it to other, other states? Would you, oh, I mean, how would you find out about it? Our Midwest region, or our central region, we do teleconferences and stuff, and okay. I've shared that uh, a number of times. Sent, sent other state conservationists the information. Did they get any assistance for that, the uh, farmers, or do they just do it on their own? They're doing it on their own. Uh, they don't have to glean it. They have volunteers that come out. Mm -hmm. Is it scattered across the state? Or? Yeah, we've got them from east to west. Any around Stillwater? Yeah, there was one down by Chandler. I don't oh. remember who the former was, but yeah, that's pretty innovative. That's it, yeah, it makes sense. I forget how many pounds we've raised on. It's a bunch, but 
the programs have really, you know, you go back to looking from 1983 when you started until now, the programs have changed. Oh, yeah. Tremendously. And, well, you know, I didn't really work in a field office much after that first year, but the Farm Bill programs have changed things a lot. Uh, when I was in Holdenville, I remember we had Great Plains and ACP, LTA long-term agreements, you know. There wasn't these big sign-ups like we have now. The money, there was no kind of money like we have now. It's just unbelievable. You know, last year we had almost $26 million of equip in Oklahoma. I mean, that's that's a big number. You can do a lot of conservation with that. What kind of budget do you have in terms of financial assistance and technical um, assistance nowadays? Yeah, it's about 32, 33. Last year it ended up about 34 million. For financial assistance? Yeah. No, that's just for TA. Just for TA. And when you put them both together, we're always over 100 million uh, wow. in Oklahoma when you put the FA and the TA together. So. And how has that changed since you started in 2013? Uh, so it's been about that. Uh, pretty constant? But, yeah. We think you know, since 83 is what I'm thinking since. Well, I don't know. In 83, it's <laughs> a, a lot, huge difference. Well, huge of course, difference. we had a lot of people in 83. I don't know how many employees we would have had. 500? Maybe even more than that. Yeah, 83, early, I don't know. Yeah, earlier than that, sure would have. But yeah. Probably still four or 500, I would think. There what is there seven now? Seven or, we're at 226. 226. Oh, half. What the is there? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a huge change. I think there were seven areas when I came on, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Nine when I started. Mm -hmm. Now we're at three. Mm -hmm. Just went to three. So we're a lot leaner. We still deliver more financial assistance than we ever have. Uh, we probably don't do as much as just going out and helping people. I hear that from farmers all the time. I'd love to just somebody come out and help me do something. Uh, unfortunately, that's one thing that we probably got away from that our customers would love us to have, but we just have this huge demand for financial assistance, and that, that takes the priority because that money has to be obligated each year or it goes away. So, you Use know, it we, or lose it, huh? Yeah. Use it or lose it. So, you know, we had $26, 27000000 million that we had to get obligated, and that takes contracts and takes work. So just going out and looking at a, at a problem or giving them some help, just some technical advice, that unfortunately is uh, getting harder to be able to do. And a lot of our customers just want that. And if, we used to do that just as an agency. That's what we did. You know, we had technical staff to go out and let's go walking over and look at this area and then, you know, this is what you ought to do and come up with a plan for them. Well, now we do that, but then it goes into a contract and we have to develop a contract because mm -hmm. we're paying for part of it and that, that creates a lot more work. A lot more paper, well, not paper now, I guess, computer. And unfortunately, a lot of our customers just come in looking for that where they did just, you know, we need help doing something. It changed stuff that farm bills have. Changed the way we are and our customers. Well, the age of the customers change much? No. Uh, there, you can start seeing, you go to meetings and there's a younger group that's starting to manage stuff, but still a lot of mature customers. You can't just say we're going to sit, put it on a web page because a lot of them don't. You, know, you go to meetings, it's surprising how many have iPads and they're doing business uh, electronically. You know, they're, they're selling cattle, they're ordering equipment, they're, they do business on iPads and online. Jimmy Emmons, he's my age. He, he's big soil health guy. He believes in social network, and he uses it. He, he's Twitter and all sorts of stuff. That's one thing I was going to ask about in your career. Even since '83, you were start, you were talking early on about filling out forms and all of that with uh, working with landowners on damages and all. Yeah. And coming from that stage till now. In your career, when did you really see the impact of computers coming on and making that transition? In? When we were, when I was in Chickasha, when we first started that, so that would have been mid eighties. Mid eighties. How did that go? Because I remember we used to send our benefit stuff to Fort Worth on these card reader. So we'd have this stack of cards 
I remember doing that, and we'd go down there, and, and I can remember being on the phone because there was an error. We'd have to change something. Uh, what was the benefits model, Dan? Dan's. There's Econ 2. Econ 2. Yeah. But, you know, we didn't have a desktop computer. We did it all by the, somewhere there was a mainframe that we'd send that off to, and they'd calculate and do our runs. We'd get this back, this huge report of the benefits. And they do that all by mail, going back and forth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. So it would have been, but I do remember getting a, a 3B2 Unix system at Chickasha. And we all had those AT&T 6300s. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was the first computer. And then it started migrating to desktop stuff when we could start doing that on our own computer. That was huge. And in the plans we put together, I remember the secretary, she'd have to type them. Mm. You know, there was no getting into Word and getting mm -hmm. a version. She typed them. And, you know, we're talking big, thick documents. And yeah, that was a huge change. So that's been in my career. So when did, did were you still working in the uh, economics part when you really started using programs? Or were you out of it by that time? And kind of moved out of it, I think. We had started doing some stuff. But I, I, I think I was kind of gone then when, when I got big. And when I left, that's when they started talking about consolidating the Claremore and Chick. We had a Claremore watershed planning office and then one in Chickasha. And uh, we used to do a lot with them. I remember a couple times a year we'd meet and do something. And Bill Porter was up there and Utley and Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember their planning engineer guy. Was Bill Johnson? Bill Johnson. Yeah. Bill Johnson was up there. So in your career was really the transition from going from well all before paper I, to Yeah, and before I left the Claremore group had moved to Chickasha. Mm -hmm. They had just moved because uh, Utley was in Chickasha. And Ferguson was in Chickasha, and so was Rick. Because I remember Utley coached my daughter in soccer. <laughs> and then his yeah. wife coached him. So they had just came to Chickasha. I'm trying to remember the staff leader that came. A Tom, couple of Tom. Tom Siebert. Tom Siebert. Mm -hmm. After talking with some of these other, other folks, it seemed like on the technology part that a number of folks were just before computers were coming on, or they made a helped him make the decision to retire. Retire. And then the earlier or the later ones coming on, I mean, that was just a way of life with oh, yeah. all of that. But you were in the transition, transition. there of, of going from... Yeah, I, went, I didn't work very long without him, but... Yeah, I mean, somebody like Ludd and those, they never really grasp it much. They still mm -hmm. use the old ways. Wouldn't but, trust them. Yeah. yeah. Don't need that kind of stuff. We can still do our stuff. But the innovation you've done with this reorganization right now, that wouldn't be possible without the technology we have today, oh, I would think, for yeah, communication no and, yeah. and also. Got people working in multiple offices, you know, and now you, you just take a laptop and you dock it wherever you need it and you can do business. You couldn't do that with in the old days. That would have been like, unheard of even 10 years ago. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. And you, now you can communicate, you can... A lot, of, a lot of people we have, they can do their job wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, now, not the ones that rely on customers coming in, but you know, some of our area staff, they can, if they can get to a, you know, Wi-Fi and a phone, they're in business. So I don't know if that's good or bad. I think it's good, but that's where it is. Mm -hmm. We got to do that. Or I think this whole reorganization that you've led is that's really innovative. When you look across the country. In the history of the agency, there's still a lot of states that are still having the traditional traditional staff in each county, and it's I just think getting it, I think it's uh, getting smaller and smaller because there's a bunch of states trying to figure out what they're going to do. It's just gotten to where now. I mean, we're not going to change our staff numbers. We're not going to grow. Mm -hmm. If we can hold our own, I think in the next three or five years, we're probably lucky. So you got you got to change something. You just can't keep doing it the way we did it 80 years ago. Because like Larry said, we had six, seven, eight hundred staff. And uh, we, we couldn't even keep one person in every county, hardly. 
Uh, and, and the other thing is we've got to transition our people where the big work is. Uh, we can't just, every county gets this many people because so much of our money comes from these programs. We've got to have people there to deliver it if we're going to earn that money. So it's it looks a little different. And uh, we just spent the last two weeks going around talking to districts at the area meetings about it. And, uh, it's different. You need I mean, push back? No, not so much. A little bit. Uh, there's a few things we decided not to do in 19 because I don't think we're quite ready yet. Uh, I think it'll over time. Once we recognize, start recognizing those teams as units and start acting like a unit mm. and not so much about counties, uh, then we'll be ready to do more things at the team, the unit area, you know, the multi-county. So it's going to take a little time, but we'll get there. We got our p leads put, picked. And we have good people. And, uh, they'll make it happen. We have a good leader. I don't know about that, but much so. we've uh, hopefully looked at everything because we, we took our time at it. And that's probably me. I'm pretty conservative in, in nature. so. And I had another really good Bill Porter. He was very analytical and thought a lot about this thing before we jumped in. We didn't want to do something that would hurt. hurt his, I don't know. And it's done nothing over the three years. It's gotten worse. So I'm so glad we did. If we were sitting here now with no plan, we'd be, oh, my God, what are we going to do? So at least we're in it and ready to go. Being proactive. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Your, about your whole career, there's been a uh, politically appointed chief, right? Do you have um, any thoughts on prior to... Purley was chief for a while as a career yeah, was employee. Career, was career, yeah. And then... Uh, Peter Myers was the first political appointee, and I think that was about the time you started. Then the the, the guy from Missouri, oh, uh, um, yeah, you know, yeah. he was career. Yeah. We've had a lot of political appointees. I like the, the career, obviously. Okay. I think a couple of things they know so much more about our agency and you know that their intent is good for the agency yeah, more invested in it I would oh think. yeah and uh, i think you feel better that every decision they're going to at least try to make is for the good of the agency political pony you just never know what agenda might be there you're always skeptical of that but we've had some good ones we've had some not so good uh, so right now we're kind of in a transition. I think we're going to get a political appointee where we're going to land. Uh, they just haven't got it through the process yet. Personally, I'd rather have a career, but um, they did just announce, though, that there was some thought about, like my boss, being a political appointee, and they're, they're not going to do that. They're going to leave the regional conservationists as career employees. So well, that's a good thing. That's good. That's good. And some of our agencies we work with, the position I'm in is a career political appointee. So, you know, it changes every, every time we have an administration change. Mm. And to me, that's what I think gives our agency more stability. Uh, I think it helps us. Because, you know, we, we could go through all this reorganization, somebody else come in and just go a totally different direction. I don't think that would happen with a career employee. You're not going to see that happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of the good things about the way we're set up. Have any thoughts on the name change of the agency back in 94? Mm. You know, I don't remember a lot about that. I, I thought it was all right. 94, so I would have been working about 10 years. I don't remember being upset that it was changed. I think if you'd worked 30 years and that happened, it might have been a little different. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I don't, I think I think it better fits us mm -hmm. in the Soil Conservation Service. Yeah, when I first started this soil, it's much, much broader than just soil. Yeah, and, yeah. and right now we're, you know, we do a lot of different things. Yeah. And, um, we're involved in a lot of different groups, have partnerships with a whole gamut of groups. Uh, ag, 
ag groups, but also NGOs and the monarch you mentioned it. I mean, that has opened up. You can't believe the people that have interest in a monarch butterfly. I mean, you know, it just also to, from the Oklahoma City Zoo to you name it, there's people who have interest in the monarch. Mm -hmm. It must be a species that everybody loves is the monarch butterfly. But so, you know, we work and, and you know, we, we have things that I don't think people would ever thought we'd ever. I mean, we have a Pheasants Forever employee right down the hall here in our staff. Uh, we pay part of his salary. We have agreements all over the, the state with different kind of shared positions with Nature Conservancy. Uh, so we're a much different agency than we were when I started. Uh, and I think it's good. I mean, we you cross all over a little bit with wildlife department, department of wildlife? Or? We, we have uh, shared positions with ODWC. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, an agreement with Oklahoma Department of Forestry where we don't have a state forester. So when we have forestry issues, we rely on some of their staff. Uh, we have shared positions with tribes. Uh, we pay for part of a conservationist that's housed in their office and they work on their tribal lands. Uh, anything to help advance conservation and help get boots out there, boots on the ground that can help do work. Mm -hmm. You know, we're willing to look and see if we can partner on. And that's a pretty broad in scope agency. And so I think I'm proud of what our agency does in that area. We'll partner with about anybody as long as the mission's right. You know, we're not going to partner with some group that's out there in left field. Uh, but, you know, we do a lot of different things like that. Mm. And uh, that's only growing and advancing. Uh, we can see more and more of it going on. Yeah, when you list all of those and you think back 35 years ago or so, it was primarily Great Plains program or ACP program. Yeah. Or Watersheds and now all conservation districts is about all we ever did, and now it's hmm. there's yeah, we're into a lot of different stuff, and and we're not unique, every state has their things like that going. Yeah, then I was reading about the Western Wild, Wildfire Initiative recently, I and mean, that's recent 2018. Yeah, we've had some devastating fires the last couple of years, the last year, or this year, still this year, Dewey. Woodward County. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's going to change. I think we're going to continue to deal with it every year. And I've been to enough conferences and heard enough meteorologists talk that, and, and, and even this year, you know, we had that big fire and they, we've had rains and rains and rains and we're loaded up again with fuel. Again, we're, we're set up for another round of it next year. And the cedar just expands, you know, just makes it even worse for our state. So I think it's just gonna be something we're gonna to have to deal with. Yeah, luckily we don't have the population centers like some of the California, but you know, we could have the same thing in outskirts of Stillwater or around Edmond. You, you start driving around and looking at the houses that are built in cedar trees, and we could have the same kind of, you know, emergency like they're having. Maybe not to quite that extent, but well, we have the wind. I, I noticed one too. Woodward. You, you ever go to that new convention center in Woodward out there? It's just south of the lake that ARS Lake. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Th that, that is just solid cedar, mm -hmm. and there are big houses all around that area, just embedded in those cedar trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, if you had the right conditions, if you had conditions like Dewey County had last year, you could all that could burn. I mean, it was 0% humidity, 60 mile an hour wind. I mean, it was just primed and ready. Well, so what would the agency's role be in, in that part? Um, well, on on the farm stuff, we're not houses, we don't really, we yeah, don't do don't. much. But on, on like Dewey County, we went back and helped rebuild fences, water facilities. If they had a, a watering trough and a solar pump out there that burned up, we'd replace that. Uh, because it was in prairie chicken part of the state, we, we can go in and remove the dead cedars. We call them skeletons. I mean, right now, it burns everything up, and you still have this skeleton tree standing there. That's a liability for the prairie chicken, so we can go in and help pay for the cost of cutting that off, burying it or burning it up, 
uh, getting rid of it. Um, we it. also paid for deferred grazing. We we will pay a rancher for 120 days so much an acre if they don't put any cattle out there, give that grass time to respond and come back. I mean, those are the kind of things that we do in wildfires. Do they have to approach you with these? We have a sign or? up. We'll have a sign up come in and we had a special sign up in Dewey, Woodward, Custer counties last year. And then that took you up on it, or? Yeah, we had 130 or 40 contracts, wow. two and a half million dollars. So, mm -hmm. and then FSA has all sorts of programs, so they'll rebuild fences, and they had millions of dollars of fences burned up out there. Wood posts, I mean, they're gone. And even melted T posts, metal posts. That's how hot really? that thing was. That's a hot fire when it melts a T-post. We've always had big emergency programs. We have an emergency watershed program for flooding where uh, we'll protect roads and bridges if they're about to wash out, if, if it's on the right size of stream and stuff. Uh, we've always had a huge EWP program. We have staff that can work on it. So. And for tornadoes, hurricanes? Tornadoes, we picked up debris. Working. On a drainage way. Drainage way. So if trees and debris gets in a creek or a drain, we can pay to clean that up if it's above a bridge or something because the thought is next big rain, all that stuff's going to flush down and get caught on that ridge and may wash the bridge out. So we've done that before on EWP. It would be this agency that does that as opposed mm -hmm. to the department. Part of the Department of Transportation or Public or Safety or whatever. FEMA or whoever, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because most of the road authorities cannot go up on the private lands. We'd enter in an agreement with somebody and do it on private land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed like dealing with extreme events, whether it's drought, fires, floods, and it seemed like that's becoming more of the norm for yeah. the last year down in Ada where they had the second highest rainfall ever recorded in the state. Yeah. That's it seems big. like it's just going to continue to get worse, mm -hmm. whether it's global warming or not. Something's changed. And then the way we get our rains, you know, we, we have dry winters, dry springs, and then come, what, July, August, September, we start getting all this massive rain, which mm -hmm. is not normal for us. But it's been that way for the last two, three, four years. Mm -hmm. So our weather's changed the way we get our moisture. And in not, fact, just not the landowners, but also the municipalities for water supplies right. and, and all. That's going to be getting more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot right. of differences there. So, mm -hmm. Moving forward, like the next five years, what do you anticipate? Um, well, I, I hope this structure gets us more efficient, gets us better, lean a little better at what we're doing. I mean, my vision is to get back with... Uh, Right now, we've been so frantic trying to deliver farm bill programs, we really haven't developed young employees, and we stick them behind a computer and they do contracts. So uh, we, we got some employees that have come on, they want to work on rangeland, or they, they want to specialize. I want to get back to where we can have, you're our rangeland specialist for this team. So any work that comes in in that area, you take care of it, and you're going to do it in these four counties or five counties. And, I mean, I think that will give us more consistency. I think it'll lead to more happy, satisfied employees. And I think it'll get us better work because they'll get better at it and get them doing things they want to do. I and mean, that's the vision of where we want to go with our structure. And we're going to start doing some of that as early as in 19, start filling some of those key positions. So, I mean, that I think that's important. Uh, we'll see what a new farm bill looks like, if there's going to be big changes if we get a new farm bill. Uh, I would love to see some changes in some of our programs, and I think they're looking at it, which is our programs are way too labor-intensive. It takes too much staff to do it. It's too complicated for uh, farmers to even understand some of it. Uh, we got we got to get streamlined. And we got some people up there working on that in our national office. We have a few people that I think know that, trying to figure it out. I think that's important. I think of any other big things. Uh, I'd love to build another watershed structure. We're getting mm -hmm. closer. 
build some new dams. What, what's next on dams. the list? I think we've got a few. Got a few. We've got a few that we are going to get funded. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we get them. Get what them part of the ground. state? Uh, part, South, part, Central. Part really. South Central. South mm -hmm. Central. Yeah, that'd be a good good thing. We could see that happen. <laughs> I can see looking ahead at every every generation has some some highlights there, whether it's program wise or whatever. But what I see with what you've instigated here, just the innovation on the reorganization, and that's really looking ahead. It's awful easy just to let the status quo go and keep on going through a career, but you're looking ahead that whole thing. And I think that's looking back. I think that's going to be a main. And that wouldn't happen if people didn't have the comfort and respect for. The leadership yeah. to make that make that work. I think that's what I see is really we'll see, strong. We'll see if it works. Uh, It'll either be good or a flop. Well, you've got a really good start. I <laughs> yeah, think I think it's going to work. We have good on. people. We have, for the most part, our employees. They've embraced it, and they. Mm -hmm. I think most of them. We we did a lot of, before we jumped in this talking, you know, and mm -hmm. for the most part, everyone said mm, it's time we need to do something a little different. You know, we've rode this horse about as long as we can. Let's see mm -hmm. if there's a better way of doing it. And I think that was kind of our vision when we started is. Mm -hmm. And we took our time and incorporated a lot of comments. We had people got a chance to review it. So it, it's not a surprise to anybody. Yeah. We've, we've taken our time doing it. And that just doesn't happen. That takes a lot of patience yeah. and buy-in. And I think there's a lot of ownership lot of out there just the way just the way it was handled. Uh, it was a little frustrating at times, but it worked. Uh, well, like I said, the election, it cost us a year because mm -hmm. everything shut down till the new group come in and stood up. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, that was the last thing they had on their mind was approving that. So yeah, I think that'll be good. And uh, our partners seem to be embracing it. Uh, Trey's all in f favor of it. so. That as long as he's pushing with us, I think we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you need to feel good about that. Looking, I think 10 years from now you look back, that's going to be a major, I hope. major piece. One of your I highlights. Mm -hmm. Not somebody said, who was that state con <laughs> that did this? Uh, who was that guy? Uh, mm -hmm. I want to forgive him. I'm curious if you've gone back to your neighbor that got you started down this path to begin. Dwayne? To begin yeah, with. I've told him that several times. Uh, he's over in Missouri now. He works uh, in programs. Yeah, he was. He was in a. We lived in a trailer park. He was in the trailer. Him and his wife Cindy. They they've long divorced, and but they had a little child. I didn't even know he worked for hardly. And then we, you know, mm -hmm. I knew he's a soil scientist. And, but uh, he said, "Yeah, they're going to be looking for a position." So he's the one who let he's you the one who got me there. And I credit my wife for getting me the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even talk to Don. Uh, but I did do the interview. That's when it all started. Holdenville. Interesting. Hometown of T Boone, right? Yeah, T Boone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, looking back, what do you consider your highlight up to this point? Not oh, I, I like the, um, there's been good things about everywhere I've been. It's hard to make a decision to move away. I never think we'd ever do that. And once you do it, there's good things about it. And there's good people everywhere. And our agencies, there's very positives everywhere. I think that was good working in different locations. I never would have got this job if I'd not worked in other places. If I'd stayed in Oklahoma and it just don't happen. It wouldn't have happened. I've seen good people qualified, and they never would have gotten a state conservation. You just got to get out and work in different places. So without that experience, I never could have been in the position I'm in now. Uh, and then you learn a lot. You meet a lot of people and learn, you know, learn the resource things you get a chance to work on in New Mexico is gra uh, greatly different than they are here. And, mm -hmm. and in the Great Lakes states, I mean, you know, just things, it, it just broadens your whole experience base. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been good. And, uh, but I, I like Oklahoma. And o I was Oklahoma. just very fortunate to get back to the home state. And uh, 
fortunate and feel fortunate that the agency allowed me to do that. And Oklahoma's fortunate to have him back. Just have, <laughs> having the daughter at OSU was your, one of that your That was one of them. She went down to play soccer. Uh, she walked on. And she had just torn her ACL her senior year in high school. And so she came down here in a cast and crutches. And that's probably the hardest thing we ever had to do is leave her here and go back home to Wisconsin. I know it's hard on her mom. So that uh, gave me a little more incentive we got to do something because the headquarters is not looking that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, did the other two come to OSU as well? The oh, yeah. other two children? Oh, yeah. So we have three more OSU grads. All, all five of us are OSU grads. We bleed orange. So your wife graduated from here too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're cowboys. Hey, that's, that's fine. Sometimes that's hard to do, hard mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. But we are. <laughs> but we are. Yeah, yeah. Did you go back and earn a master somewhere along the way? No. As part of their, you know, the agency or anything? No. Never did. Well, you didn't need to, obviously. Yeah, no, that would probably you. been good. And my advisor just, just retired, James Trapp. Uh, just retired last year. Um, so I worked with him at the state technical committee and some other things for a number of years. Kind of lost track of me and I lost track of him, but it's just funny how that all works out. Okay. So, any of the children into your same business? No, no, <laughs> no. I have an account, a CPA. My son's a CPA, and uh, the daughters are both in uh, tourism. One is a, a director of Bricktown, so she works for a board that made up of businesses in Bricktown. And then the middle one is uh, Oklahoma County Visitors Bureau. She brings, tries to attract conventions in Oklahoma City. So. Well, some of the same skill set that, that you have, they, uh, they have. They're a little better at that than others. It could do agri-tourism. Agri yeah. We don't have big enough groups coming. She likes the big ones to come in. So. Yeah. That's all so, my questions. Do you have anything else there? No. Anything no, that we need to cover that we don't know well, to ask? No? No, pretty boring. Just straightforward. Well, my last question then is, how do you want history to react to you, or you know, if when it's written, what what do you want us to remember uh, about Gary O'Neill? I don't know. Came back to Oklahoma take, and took did care good. of people. Maybe I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, just good, easy to work with, and I try to try not to be too difficult. Mm -hmm. Fair, uh, but. Uh, we have, we have a good staff, and uh, not that we don't have challenges, but I think we have good, good employees. We must look part everywhere in our agencies that way, for the most part. Well, that's what I'm picking up on, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been interesting. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate it.